Bueno, it's, it's good to have you all here. My name is James Patton. I'll be moderating uh, this event. I come from an organization called the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, based in Washington. We work principally with religious actors and religious faith in areas of conflict, intractable identity conflict, to see if that element of the culture can form part of the resolution of those conflicts. So we're currently in Syria, in Yemen, in Saudi, in, in uh, Pakistan, and in Colombia, with some other things growing. So that's where I'm coming from. The discussion today is about <coughs> the question of shared ethics or universal principles that can be held by people of different faith traditions where they can encounter one another in the description of what they're brought together to do in the world based on their doctrinal motivations. Um, it's, it's not an easy conversation. We do this a lot at ICRD. We have a lot of different spaces in which people of different doctrines try to find a way to talk to one another, and they don't start with the doctrinal conversation. They start with a conversation about challenges that they share in the world, and oftentimes through that they find what are their doctrinal motives. Oftentimes if you start with the doctrinal conversation, the conversation ends right away, right? So I generally tend to, to begin the conversation by asking the religious leaders in the room, are all of your compatriots, whatever the faith might be, good people? Are all X good people, Muslims, Christians, evangelicals, shamans? And invariably the answer is no, no, of course not. Of course not, there's some jerks in my, you know, in my village. And then the question is, are all of your doctrine bad people? No, 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 tampoco. You know, we know some good people that are from different traditions. Because they see that within their own faith tradition, they can still grow towards something. They have an idea that people that share their faith don't necessarily arrive at perfection just by virtue of carrying a book under their arm. There is a question of growth. There's a question of advancement, and they can meet each other there and work with one another to lift the whole human community. <clears throat> so the conversation to define shared universal principles, even though it's challenging, has to really kind of base itself around first building empathy between the actors. I was asked to talk a little bit about why for religious leaders is it so difficult to meet at the level of this challenge. And I think that's the theme that most of our speakers will talk about. Why is it so difficult to meet one another at this challenge? Universal principles, whether it be peacemaking, whether it be youth, etc. Most of the faithful are sharing some element of their aspiration in that space. Right? And I can tell you from first-hand experience, conflict entrepreneurs, people who are fomenting violence, whether it be drug trafficking or ethnic violence, they don't care where you're coming from as long as you're advancing their goal. And yet as peacemakers, we constantly divide ourselves by virtue of the doctrine that we hold or don't hold. So we are doing ourselves a massive disservice. <clears throat> so that's my thought. Now let me pass on the, uh, the microphone to those who are, as we say, paid to be here. <clears throat> and I've lost the first biography. Here we are. His Excellency, Jaime Paz Zamora was the constitutional president of the Republic of Bolivia from 1989 to 1993. He also served as vice president. Mr. Zamora studied social and political sciences at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Did I pronounce that right? Leuven? Um, and later taught sociology and international relations at the higher University of San Andres in La Paz, Bolivia. He also served as Director of Foreign Policy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bolivia. He is one of the founders and leaders of the political party Movimiento de la Izquierda Revolucionaria, Nueva Mayoría, or the MIR in Bolivia. <coughs> so it is my honor to pass uh, the microphone to ex-president Jaime Paz Samuel. Thank you, sir. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos. Eh, primero quiero expresarles una preocupación. Una preocupación. Porque en un evento tan grande como este, hay pocos que se interesan en el tema del, 
diálogo interreligioso. Creo que ustedes son los más inteligentes, los que están sentados aquí, porque eh, yo estoy convencido de que eh, la crisis bajo distintas formas que se da en nuestro tiempo es una crisis del espíritu más, de que, más que de la materia es una crisis espiritual que se expresa de distintas maneras eh, dependiendo del tipo de cultura el tipo de religión ligado a la cultura pero que en el fondo es una crisis del espíritu eh, es por eso que en la intervención que yo hice eso, en la misión presidencial latinoamericana eh, señalé que a América Latina lo que le falta son paradigmas espirituales yo no creo ese optimismo de que porque se va creciendo al 5% al 6% o 7% del PIB América Latina esté bien encaminada yo creo que América Latina tiene un problema profundo del espíritu y en el fondo un profundo espíritu o una profunda crisis religiosa. Por eso es que yo hablé, me permití hablar de la necesidad de crear nuevos paradigmas, nuevas utopías en base al amor y en base a los espacios amables, que decía, la necesidad de crear espacios amables. Eh, que creo que nos evitaría los problemas de si el Estado, si el libre mercado, es decir, los espacios amables que tienen que ver con los valores trascendentes, que tienen que ver con la fe, ¿verdad? Y yo creo que cuando hablamos de diálogo interreligioso, estamos hablando de un diálogo entre intermediaciones, porque ¿qué es la religión? La religión es, bueno, por lo menos en español sale del religare del latín es la, la ligación del creyente con Dios con la divinidad pero ahí hay una intermediación que son las religiones o sea, la religión es una intermediación y por lo tanto cuando decimos diálogo interreligioso estamos diciendo de un diálogo entre distintos tipos de intermediaciones entre el creyente y la divinidad. Entonces yo creo que para que podamos tener eh, un progreso en este diálogo debemos comprender que de alguna manera también casi en todas las intermediaciones religiosas hay problemas, hay situaciones de crisis en el campo del espíritu. Yo por eso pondero, por ejemplo, como católico, cristiano católico, pondero al actual Papa Francisco, que no trajo otra novedad que sencillamente hacer los reconocimientos y la reforma de la intermediación religiosa en la vida cotidiana. Él no se metió en dogmas, no, se me, no, no entró como Papa eso, pero sí entró qué intermediario debe ser él como Papa para la vida cotidiana del creyente. Y creo que nos ha dado mensajes en esa dirección. Y yo aquí quiero decirles que yo hablé antes en la exposición anterior de un latinoamericano que se llamaba Néstor Pazamón, un hermano mío, que así como el Papa Francisco, que de ser Mario Bergoglio, un argentino, italiano, para ser Papa se puso el nombre de Francisco. ¿Por qué? quería imitar a, a San Francisco de Asís que era un, un ejemplo para él 
Pero lo interesante es que 40 años antes hubo un latinoamericano de 25 años de edad que para ir a inmolarse en nombre de su fe, de su religión, se puso también el nombre de Francisco. Se fue con el nombre de Francisco como el Papa hoy día. Bueno, eh, lo interesante es que este latinoamericano que se inmoló decía en cuanto al amor, por ejemplo, tenía una definición extraordinaria, decía, el amor es la necesidad urgente de resolver el problema del otro donde está Dios, una necesidad urgente de resolver el problema. Y yo creo que la Iglesia Católica, hoy por hoy, en ese aporte que puede hacer la Iglesia Católica, el Papa está llevando toda su visión a mostrarle al ciudadano común, al católico común, que su fe se basa en la necesidad de resolver el problema del otro. Yo creo que es el aporte en el diálogo interreligioso. Gracias, su excelencia. Um, the, this point about working for the protection of the other, if I can just add one story. We were in Nepal in January, and I had Diobandi and Wahhabi Muslim leaders from Pakistan and mega church pastors, evangelicals from the United States, who were sitting around a table, 20 individuals, talking about how they can help one another protect religious minorities in each other's context. And they were finding their doctrinal framework for that from the Quran and from the Bible. As one of the pastors said, he wasn't there creating Chrislam. He was, he was a devout Christian, but he was trying to find in his brethren from another faith tradition a way to address a common problem that they were called to address through their faith tradition. Thank you very much for that. Um, a housekeeping note. We've changed a little the format, and I meant to say this at the beginning. Rather than 15 minutes for everyone, because we have a, a bigger table than we anticipated, more voices, we're going to do five minutes each person, and then open it up to a, a kind of town hall discussion. So hopefully you all keep your, your questions in mind and we can pick them around up here uh, at the table. The other thing is that it's live streaming on the internet. And so keep that in mind and fix your ties and all that kind of thing because people are gonna be watching. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Schiller, uh, with whom I had a battle with a monkey in Malaysia. So that's uh, probably how I'll remember you for the rest of my life. Um, he was the savior of my glasses. <laughs> a monkey had stolen his sunglasses. We resolved it non <laughs> Dr. Schiller is, is the chairman and principal of Comstar Media, which manages two cable networks that provide positive, family-oriented programs to 40 million households. Dr. Schiller is a popular American televangelist and author of 17 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Walking in Your Own Shoes. He is also a former minister of the Hour of Power television program with more than 20 million viewers every week. A widely known international speaker, Dr. Schiller is a member of GPF's Global Leadership Council and is the co-chair of the Coalition for America, American Renewal, I believe it's supposed to say. Dr. Schiller was awarded a doctorate degree by National Hispanic University for his charity work in Mexico and uh, another honorary doctorate from California Graduate School of Theology for his extensive work in ministry. And I have had the pleasure of hearing him speak several times and it's a captivating experience. So please open your ears. Jaime Paz, in, in America your name would be Jim Peace. <laughs> and and um, it's, it's a peace. Yeah, James Peace, exactly. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be able to sit next to a man of peace and, and talk about a subject that, which is dear and, and, and very important to all of us, regardless of our faith, because each of our faith traditions suffer tremendously from persecution. Very few people have heard the statistics of Christian persecution. We hear the statistics of, of Jewish and Muslim and other faiths quite often, but I don't know how many people have ever heard the statistics of the ongoing martyrdom of Christianity. According to uh, the recent studies, 
that one Christian dies for his faith every five minutes mm. somewhere in the world. Which means that during this conference, there will be nearly 500, actually 600 people, 600 Christians who will die for their faith. So it is an ongoing issue for all of us, regardless of our faith. And one that needs to be addressed, one that needs to be taken seriously. Now obviously this is something that was taking place in the first century when, our, when Christianity began. It was, a, it was an enormous issue as the rule of thumb at that time was to eliminate this faith before this set before it became an issue. And so St. Paul addressed this issue and it it's, appears very clearly in his letter to the Church of Galatia. Now St. Paul was one of the first one of the first Christians, the, the apostles of Jesus. And here's what he said. He said, he said now, he said the 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 works of the flesh and the evil, work, the evil work is very evident to all. And I think if we look at what he how he describes this, every single one of our faiths will agree with this list. Listen to this. The works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness. Now, all of these are the evil nature, the one that's obvious to us all. Uh, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousness, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revi um, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand. Then he says, however, however, we live, we the law becomes unimportant to us if we live by the spirit of the law. And what is the spirit of the law? And here's what he says. The, the spirit of the law is this. And if you have a problem with any of these, let me know. Just raise your hand. Okay, just raise your hand. If we live this way, we don't need anything else. Here's what he says. Love. Any issue there? So far, so good. Joy. Oh, we're okay. Peace. Long suffering. <laughs> Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self control. Those are the nine things. He stops right there. If we have those principles, those guiding lights, those um, characteristics, he refers to them as the fruit of the Spirit. If we have those and we allow those things to live within us and grow within us, then the law becomes insignificant because we actually live above the law, meaning that we, we do more than any law will ever require or ask. And that's the way that this issue was addressed by St. Paul in the very first century. So, that is, that, is, that is my message today. I was told to keep it down to five minutes as opposed to 15, so I cut out everything else. And there it is, very simple. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And if we have those things, the law becomes insignificant. And it crosses all the boundaries of all religions. And you echo uh, the, the words of one of the presidents, and I don't remember who it was, if it was uh, President Mesa or if it was President Navarro, who said, put love at the center of our society by constructing Spaces, friendly spaces. It was actually good. Yeah, was, yeah. Oh, that was. I, I knew it'd be here. So let me credit the person. <laughs> so, um, so th this is this is the uh, the core of looking for shared principles. Sometimes it's just simple. Sometimes you get back to the most simple thing, right? And it doesn't have to be all this this complicated doctrinal hoopla, right? I work with shamans, indigenous shamans, and evangelical pastors in Colombia. And they're starting at the idea that harmony and healing for the shamans is a lot like reconciliation and love for the, for the Christians. Let's start there and see what we can do to help the country. We can deal with doctrine later. 
So, thank you very much. <coughs> now, Dr. Yoon <coughs> Kyung Ro is a Korean historian and the former president of Hansung University. Dr. Yoon received an MA in history education and a PhD in modern Korean history from Korea University. He was a professor of modern Korean history at College of Humanities of Hansung University from 1981 until 2012. And he has served as a visiting professor at University of Washington in Seattle and Peking University in China. Professor Yoon has been president of a number of major Korean NGOs, including Citizens Coalition for Economic Justice, Overseas Koreans Foundation for Education, and YMCA So. He has also served as a committee member of Veterans Affairs and National Institute of Korean History. We're going to have a bit of a tangled web of translation going, but I think we've got everybody need, everybody's needs covered. And I'll ask the translator, if you don't mind, to speak into the microphone so that the Spanish to English or English to Spanish can hear and translate that.
globalization era고 globalization age라는 말을 많이 씁니다. Estamos hablando mucho últimamente la era global. 세계가 하나의 꽃밭이라고 했을 때그 꽃밭이 한 색깔의 꽃으로 이루어지는 것이 아름다우냐? 아니면 여러 색깔의 노란색, 빨간색, 하얀색 이런 여러 꽃들이 다양한 냄새를 내고 다양한 모습으로 어, 함께 어우러 사는 것이 좋냐? 라고 생각해 보면 좋겠습니다. Bueno, ustedes piensen cómo quieren que esa era global sea, que sea un jardín de un solo color, con un solo aroma, o quieren que sea un jardín con varios colores, con varios aromas. 저는 이 GBF 모임이 바로 얼굴이 다르고 언어가 다르고 지역이 다르고 문화가 다르고 종교가 다르지만 우리가 하나의 여러 색색 나라의 색깔을 내는 우리 모든 일과 하나가 돼서 함께 에, 인류의 행복과 인류의 번영과 평화를 위해서 바로 이 GBF가 아, 아, 하려고, 하려고 하는 그런 목적이 있는 것이 아닌가 합니다. Ustedes pueden ver que hoy estamos participando gente de diferentes culturas, religiones, razas y que todos estamos con el mismo fin de la prosperidad, la felicidad y la paz de todo el mundo. 그래서 우리 21세기에 이 사회적 변화의 토대로서의 세계 윤리적인 구조로서 이 홍이 인간에 대한 우리 모두가 이해를 하고 그럴 때또 문현민 박사가 하고 있는 이 집계 뜻이 좀더 글로벌하게 알려질 수 있지 않을까 이렇게 생각합니다. 네, 감사합니다. So, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, or even just a Christian concept, different parts of Christianity being represented, like in Colombia, when they say ecumenical, they mean the Catholics and the Protestants talk together. Here at GPF, I found a lot more diversity, and the voices of everyone seem to be represented with the goal of trying to identify these universal principles. So thank you very kindly for explaining a bit of the background in Dr. Moon's vision. Now, Dr. Moises. I don't want to do damage to your name. Uh, is the chair of the Religious Studies and Humanities Department at Rosemont College in Pennsylvania. He received his AB degree, summa cum laude, from Florida Southern College and his PhD from Boston University. Go Red Sox. A native of Yugoslavia, Dr. Moises studied at the Belgrade University Law School for two years prior to coming to the United States. He is the co-editor of the Journal of Ecumenical Studies and founder and co-editor of Religion in Eastern Europe. Stop there? Okay, because yeah, I can sing, I think it goes on for 14 pages, but it's a pleasure. We had the chance to talk this morning, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you. I wrote my paper with the purpose of serving to transition societies, because what's happening right now in the world is that a huge number of formerly authoritarian or uh, totalitarian governments have toppled and have been sometimes successfully and sometimes less successfully replaced by democratic societies or post-authoritarian societies. We don't always know which way they're going to come out. Witness the Arab Spring, which some years ago we were hoping it will all end up democratically, and it's not happening. Uh, I am also quite um, cognizant of the fact that I think all of us share, and that is that our societies are becoming more and more pluralistic. There's a huge movement of people. Uh, uh, our educational institutions are providing greater diversity and so on, and you can rarely now find a society where one particular moral code uh, obtains. I think Saudi Arabia may be one of the very few countries in which that is the case. So we live in these um, 
multi pluralistic societies and and the question then is which moral norms apply and a lot of people say well why should I follow this normal moral code when my next door neighbor follows something entirely different or doesn't follow one at all and uh, that leads to the kind of relativism that we heard the president's uh, debate a little while ago and saying that that's dangerous and I would agree with that but, but our choice is only only very simple either somebody is going to impose one single moral code on all of us and that's not called democracy or it's going to be a um, egal not egalitarian um, what was the word they were just using I'm getting old <laughs> um, help me with the word somebody <laughs> no 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 I just used the word a little while where everybody chooses their own, their own thing to do everything is Relativism, thank you. Relativism, but there is there is a third option. My third option that I proposed in the paper is for governments of the new states to be willing to accept the input by the various religious communities, but it would require the religious communities to get their act together to be discussing how they can find certain commonalities they could propose for the population to be willing to live under those general codes of, of behavior. And what I've done in the paper, and I'm not going to repeat much of it, is there are two major concepts that I found, one a Catholic and one a Protestant. The Catholic concept is the common good. The Roman Catholic Church has used that concept for many, many centuries, and Pope John XXIII had given it particularly effective uh, um, definition. By the way, you can look up on the internet for many uh, commentators, ethicists, who are then expounding that concept of the common good. Uh, uh, Protestant churches in the World Council of Churches, also Orthodox churches, have proposed a concept called a concept of the responsible society that's also defined in the paper. I don't have the time to uh, read about it, but basically the responsible society is responsible to its own citizens for the way in which it utilizes power. And then finally, I, I suggested that the religious communities in the world have already started working on a, they call it sometimes a global religious ethics. In um, 1994, in Chicago, Illinois, there was a parliament of world religions that had met at the 100th anniversary of another such meeting. And during that meeting, a Catholic theologian by the name of Hans Kuhn had elaborated with a group of people a proposal for a global, global ethics that has been quite well received by a lot of people. They had, of course, invited also anybody who wishes to uh, enter into that discussion and debate to propose modifications or additions, or deletions of that. Um, another colleague, Leonard Swigler, has likewise worked on that kind of a project. And what I've done in the paper, and then I don't have the time to do that here, is I excerpted from those global ethics certain principles, I think I have about seven or eight of them, that I think would be particularly applicable to transitional societies. But you'll have to read the paper in order to find out what it is. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. And these, it's, it's correct that the, the written presentations, if they're given to GPF, will be on the website, right? And so you can go back and read the material um, that's in there. Uh, it's, it's a challenge to get faiths to start talking to one another about what they share because you eventually run into this question of who decides on things that they disagree about. Where does, where does that happen? And oftentimes I, that kind of engagement tends to start breaking down the collaboration, which frankly, unfortunately... But in the meantime, we can move on to those things that we do. Correct. So, 
which requires very good facilitation. You know, so um, it's unfortunate that the place where we have housed our greatest aspirations and our and our greatest uh, spiritual motivations tends to be the place where we find we can't get get along with our fellow human beings. So that's an important thing to resolve. Dr. Marsui, I had the pleasure of meeting you and talking to you both in Malaysia and in Washington, D.C. in the ICRD office. And uh, I have lost your biography, so I'm going to make something up. Um, you are the, the director of Nahatul Ulema. And aside from that, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My blessing and peace of Allah be upon with you all. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Happy audience ladies and gentlemen. My name just now mentioned is uh, Masuki Suhud from Indonesia. Indonesia actually have uh, the population of Indonesia. 250 million people and the religion there are there is a Christian, Catholic, Protestant, Hindu, Buddhist and maybe all the religion all the religion are there in Indonesia with the kind of many religion in Indonesia Muslim as a majority think that the differences is a fact Differences is a fact. That's why, although they are, uh, although we have a different religion, different language, different uh, color, or different everything, we can live together in Indonesia under five principles. The five, these five, these five principles, we can call it Pancasila. Pancasila is mean five principle. Panca meaning five. Sila principle. This moral principle, five moral principle, or this uh, moral value of Indonesian basic foundation principle is the first uh, in Bahasa Indonesia Ketuhanan Yang Maha Esa or Believe in the one and only God. And then second, just and humanity. And three, the unity of Indonesia. And four, democracy guided by the inner wisdom of deliberation among representatives. And five, the realization of social justice for all of the people of Indonesia. This moral value actually regarded by the all religion in Indonesia. My organization, Nahdlatul Ulama, established before the Independent Day of Indonesia on 1926. Independent Day of Indonesia is 1945. The leaders of my organization and other organization, our member now is 80 million members of Nahdlatul Ulama organization the population 250 million our member 80 million members so the majority muslim countries in the world is indonesia indonesia is equal with 12.9 percent total muslim in the world live in indonesia and we live in differences different religion Although we have or we use Bahasa Indonesia as our national language, but also we have 300 local languages in Indonesia and 300 uh, 3,000 islands in Indonesia. Actually, very different to unify all countries with these differences. But through the moral, through the values of each religion exists in Indonesia. We can sit together among others, among the leaders, we can discuss something. Different opinion, different thinking, 
is actually no problem. But sometimes different earning will become a problem. Different thinking, no problem. Different earning sometimes become a problem. That's why actually we should think how the people can earn something not only the top they can earn something more but also the society also should have more because uh, earning something will become a problem my brothers actually if there is a problem in the world, not maybe not only in Indonesia, problem of the religion between Muslim and other Muslim, uh, between Muslim and Muslim, between Muslim and other religion, maybe not only in Indonesia and in another country also, but the majority problems coming from not coming from religion. Sometimes coming from uh, the conflict coming from economic and the conflict coming from uh, social social relationship but we got difficulties when now in the Middle East there are many conflicts like in uh, uh, Iraq, Syria and then in Libya maybe not only the people from Indonesia joining ISIS, you know, maybe from America, from Australia, America more than 100, from Europe more than 6,000, uh, yeah? from Indonesia just only 60, only 60 person. But if they come back to our, our uh, country they will disturb others <coughs> maybe they will make another conflict in our country also in another country you know when uh, the people from Indonesia and then uh, they joining struggling in Libya before coming back to Indonesia and they become a hardliner also they uh, make a conflict on their region. That's why it is difficult for us sometimes that we should hand in a hand with other people, other religion, focus on this problem. Thank you. We can discuss everything later and we can continue together. Thank you very much, Dr. Marsui. Uh, I, I was in a debate the other day about religion and conflict, and the gentleman who I was debating started off by saying religion is the single most sinister driver of conflict and the most dangerous thing in the world today. <laughs> Which may be true, but I responded, the vast majority of religious believers understand their faith to be nonviolent. And so rather than just focusing on the folks who are understanding their doctrinal compulsion to lead them to violence, why don't we empower the people who understand it the other way around? And part of that communication, like you said, coming with different ideas to the table is not bad. Conflict is normal. Conflict is not bad. What do you do with it? Do you create new relationships and institutions? So this is very helpful. Thank you very much. And I, I, the fact that you point out that a lot of these problems have practical origins, that's very true. I mean, uh, marginalization, economic, access to education, access to some sort of identity tends to be what drives a lot of folks into groups that have a, a doctrinal framework supposedly, but they're really an identity group and that mobilizing violence is something that gives them a place to feel connected. So society has to give them a different place to feel connected. Thank you very much, <coughs> Dr. Marsu. The last word, at least in, in terms of the panel, <coughs> lands with uh, our rabbi, Rabbi Julian Weinstein. Weinstein. Uh, 
I love that you start with your family on your bio. It says, Rabbi Julian Weinstein is 39 years old and married to Gabriela, but not my daughter Gabriela, because she's only four. <laughs> with whom he has two children, Sophia and Jair. Yeah. That's lovely, thank you. Everybody always cuts my family out of the bio too long. That's the first thing they cut, but that's the most important piece. He is a rabbi of the Jewish community of Paraguay and was formerly a rabbi of the provinces of Mendoza and Salta in Argentina. Mendoza, for those of you who are wondering, is where all the good wine comes from. Uh, he was a rabbi of Concepcion, Chile, and he graduated from the Rabbinical Seminary of Buenos Aires in the Machon Schechter Institute. Uh, just destroyed German, uh, in Jerusalem, or Hebrew or Yiddish. <laughs> he is an expert in halacha, did I get that right? Jewish law, halacha, and in the Talmud. So I will pass uh, the last panel word to Rabbi Julian. Thank you very much. Thank you for pero bueno, tratando de resumir las ideas que tenía aquí escritas, creo que es importante hablar de ética, no tanto, muchas veces confundimos ética con moral. Y la ética es entender la diferencia entre el bien y el mal como términos absolutos. Y muchas veces la moral es una construcción social. Es algo que, que las culturas van construyendo y van entendiendo qué es lo moral según ciertas conveniencias. La ética, como dije, es absoluto y para, para mí, para muchos, eh, los conceptos éticos no vienen de Dios, son las leyes divinas. Y al respecto quería comentar un, una anécdota. Cuando Dios entrega los diez mandamientos, dice en el texto bíblico que las leyes estaban grabadas Harut es en hebreo, grabadas en las tablas. Y en hebreo se juega mucho con, con las palabras y en lugar de decir, entendieron los rabinos, que en lugar de decir Harut grabadas, decía Jerut, que es libertad. Que la ley, si sí, la ley divina nos da libertad, si ¿sí? comprometernos, el cumplir con las leyes de Dios, nos brinda a todos la libertad. ¿sí? Esto por, por un lado. Y a partir de ahí creo que, que todo lo demás se puede ir desprendiendo. Incluso muchas veces decimos que es importante creer en Dios. Y hay otra enseñanza que Dios dice que a Él no le importa que crean en Él, sino que más le importa que cumpla su ley. Y creo que ese es nuestro problema. ¿sí? A veces no entendemos esto. ¿sí? Que, sí, que somos creyentes, pero a la hora de la práctica estamos muy distantes de lo que Dios nos pide que hagamos. Obviamente, ¿qué es lo que Dios nos pide que hagamos? Sí, ser rectos, sí, buscar el bien, el bien de todos. Y que si sí, todas las religiones abrámicas, principalmente los cristianos y los judíos, compartimos un principio, que acá se habló del amor, ama a tu prójimo como a ti mismo. Y dicen, esa es la ley primera. Así que a partir de ahí se desprenden todas las leyes. Jesús reiteró este concepto, que es un concepto de la Torah. Pero en la Torah también dice otra cosa, que a veces nos olvidamos. Cuando hablamos del prójimo, creo que todos, muchas veces, pensamos, el prójimo es el próximo. Sí, el que conocemos, el que está al lado nuestro, el que convivimos con él. Pero también... En el texto bíblico nos dice ama al extranjero. Nos olvidamos de eso. ¿Y ¿Quién es el extranjero? El que no conocemos, el que es distinto. El otro. Si sí, Levinas, Emanuel Levinas, habla de, de Dios como el absolutamente otro. Si sí, amar al extranjero es lo más próximo que tenemos a amar a Dios. Al distinto. ¿Sí? ¿Cómo podemos establecer esto? Conociendo, nos dialogando, conversando, tratando de, de encontrarnos. Y dice que, que lo más grande que tiene la ética es poder encontrar principios éticos comunes. Creo que todos los tenemos cuando hablamos de principios comunes, todos vamos a 
pero no recuerdo que es lo mismo. Platica nos brinda puertas. ¿Sí? Para encontrarnos. Para saber quién es el otro. Y ahí las diferencias se van a chicar. Quería compartir también una, una pequeña enseñanza de un rabino Luis Salanta, que es el Salanta, que dice así. Si todos aquí creo que somos religiosos, ¿sí? practicamos las religiones y vamos a tener algo creo que para tener presentes. Una persona, si es así de Rabí Salanta, debe preocuparse más por lo espiritual que por las cuestiones materiales. Si sí, hablaba antes de que haya una crisis espiritual. Pero dice así. Pero el bienestar material de las otras personas debe ser nuestra preocupación espiritual. Si lo que necesita el otro materialmente tiene que ser mi preocupación espiritual. Y lo material puede ser lo económico, lo físico, todo. Y eso debe ser lo que nos tenemos que ocupar como personas religiosas, como personas espirituales. Y se habla de corrupción, se habla de maldad, y muchas veces se habló también en el, en el anterior de que los jóvenes dicen y queda todo lo mismo. Sin sí, total, todo el mundo hace las cosas bien, hace las cosas mal, y pareciera que nada, nada tiene relevancia. El Señor nuestros rabinos en el Tratado de los Principios en la Mishnah, en también del siglo I, dice, en un lugar donde no hay hombres, se lo tú. Sí, lo principal acá es tratar de ser hombres. Y último, para ir cerrando, cuando antes de entregarse los diez mandamientos en el texto bíblico, aparece otro relato que estaba Moisés jugando al pueblo de Israel de la noche a la mañana y ve su suelo y tró y le dice, ¿qué haces todo vos solo jugando? Y se pone jueces, ¿qué hace caso? Y se preguntan los rabinos, ¿por qué este relato está antes de la entrega de los diez mandamientos? Si no había leyes, ¿cómo puede haber justicia? A lo cual nuestros sabios dijeron que está así, aunque haya pasado después, para enseñarnos un principio de dejar el Shadma la Torah, sin que ser una persona con mayúsculas, en Yiddish diríamos o en alemán, Mech, ser una persona íntegra, está antes que la misma Torah, que la misma ley de Dios, que cualquier cosa. Y si no tenemos este espíritu, cuando entendemos nuestras leyes, de ser personas, de buscar el bien común entre todos, cualquier ley, Gracias, Daniela. Muchas gracias.